Have you ever heard of the term GDV? It actually is a life-threatening emergency situation for your dog. I'm Dr. M, welcome to VMC. Today we are going to dive into the topic of bloat and gastric dilatation bulbulus. We are going to discuss what you can do as far as prevention, what symptoms you need to watch out for, and what the treatment looks like. So stay tuned for some crucial insights that could be life-saving for your dog. Join me. You'll learn something today. Bloat and GDV are very commonly associated with a rapid ingestion of a large amount of food. The presence of food and then also gas in the stomach causes the gastric body or the stomach to dramatically inflate and expand. Bloats, as you'll often hear it referred to. But then if the stomach rotates or flips, this is when we call it a dilatation, so enlargement and volvulus flipping. The rotation can lead to a blockage in blood flow to the actual stomach wall. It can also cause a blockage in blood flow to the spleen. The longer that a GDV is present, the more secondary effects you're going to see on the entire body. And that reduction in blood flow causes immense amounts of pain, which is also incredibly serious. Now that you know what bloat and GDV are, let's talk about risk factors. To be fair, we don't fully understand all of the risk factors for bloat and GDV, but there are a number we are aware of. Dogs that have an increased ratio of thoracic height to width, so a deep chest, are at higher risk. Dogs that are fed one meal a day are also at higher risk. There's also a link with having elevated food bowls. This is why for the majority of healthy dogs, having raised food bowls is not recommended. There is also a genetic component. So if your dog is related to other dogs who have had bloat and or GDV, then your dog is at an increased risk as well. Also, dogs that are middle-aged and older have an increased risk compared to very young dogs. If your dog has had a splenectomy, so their spleen has been removed, that does increase their risk. There's also an increased risk in large and giant breed dogs, but you should be aware that this doesn't mean that small breed dogs don't experience this. We see bloat and or GDV in all breeds. It's just more common in large and giant breed dogs. There's also a possibility that a stressed dog can have an increased risk. There was also a study from 2000 2006 that showed if the dog food that they are eating is high in oils, those formulas are associated with an increased risk of bloat and GDV. Let's talk about specific breeds that are known to have higher risk than other breeds. The poster child for a GDV is the Great Dane. They have that deep chest and up to 40% of Great Danes will experience bloat and GDV at some point in their life if they do not have preventive measures taken for them. Weimariners, St. Bernards, Irish Setters, Standard Poodles, Rottweilers, there are also a bunch of other breeds that do have a bit of an increased risk. Next, let's move on to talk about symptoms. Initially, this will look like abdominal pain, which can be tough for people to pick up sometimes. It can mean that the dog gets a bit anxious. They might be looking at their abdomen. They might be standing with a hunched back. They might be stretching out their abdomen or doing what we call the prayer position. That's a classic position dogs with abdominal pain will use sometimes. You might also see drooling. They might have a bloated abdominal appearance. You can also see that they might be retching but not bringing anything up. And of course, there's often a history where they've eaten a large amount of food recently. As time passes, we will see them progress to doing a lot of panting. This is usually pain related. They might also be panting because they're having a hard time with breathing. They won't be able to settle or sleep. Their abdomen will continue to look bloated or get more bloated perhaps. They can be weak 
and they might collapse. Sometimes they won't be able to get up. Just depends on how long it's been since the bloat and or gastric dilatation volvulus has started. The longer it's present, the worse things get. So what's important here is that if you're seeing these sorts of symptoms, this is an emergency. Call the clinic that you are going to to let them know that you're on the way and what's going on with your dog. Once you get to the clinic, expect that there will be a medical workup. We do a physical exam. We will also often check blood work and urinalysis because we are looking to see what problems the other organs in the body are having with functioning because we know hypoxia will cause problems to the liver, the kidneys, and so on. Of course, we're also needing to rule out other diseases that can look quite similar upon presentation. The way that we confirm the diagnosis is with an x-ray. There's quite a classic appearance to what these x-rays look like. The way I learned it in veterinary school was to look for a smurf hat. We then would ideally check an electrocardiogram in order Order to look for arrhythmias and cardiac disturbances. If we have the option, a blood gas analysis is very helpful so that we can assess how much respiratory compromise is currently present and then work to treat that as well. As I always say, the individual diagnostics and treatment plan may vary a bit depending on what your individual dog looks like, what tests and tools we have available to us and so on. So let's cover treatment next. Initial stabilization is important. Once your dog is sufficiently stabilized, then they do require surgery. Once the stomach has been returned to the proper position and any dead tissues have been surgically resected, then it's absolutely a must that the stomach is what people commonly refer to as tacked to the abdominal wall. There are a number of different ways that this can occur, but essentially the technique is to create some scar tissue between the edge of the stomach and the edge of the abdominal wall. The purpose of this procedure is to prevent the reoccurrence of volvulus in the future if the tacking is not done. Roughly a 55% risk of recurrence within the next year. In patients where they do have the tacking done, that risk drops down to below 4%. It's a dramatic reduction, and so tacking the stomach is an absolute must. There is quite a variation regarding expected prognosis. In best case scenarios, the risk of your dog dying is around 20%, but there are going to be cases where it's as high as a 60% chance that your dog will not make it. One of the biggest factors that impacts prognosis is the amount of time that the GDV has been present for. This is why I really harp on how how exceptionally important it is to get veterinary care immediately. Don't wait this one out and hope it gets better. After surgery, your dog will require hospitalization for some time. The exact amount of time is going to vary from patient to patient and how they recover. Then once they are home, there will be exercise restriction for a number of weeks so that the tacked stomach can heal and also so that the incisions can heal. There will be long-term dietary management and for these dogs, it will be crucial that they're fed more small meals per day. We tend to say at least three meals per day for dogs with this sort of a history. It will also be very important to closely monitor for any recurrence of symptoms. If you've followed the channel for a while, you know that I am all about prevention. I would much rather we prevent you from ever having a problem over your dog's lifetime than have to treat something when it pops up. There's little exceptions to every general guideline, right? So talk to your local veterinarian, but in general, feed multiple meals per day. Do not elevate bulls off of the ground. Try to work on your dog's quality of life so that they're not experiencing chronic stress. Make sure that you're monitoring them for symptoms of abdominal pain and seek veterinary care when you need to. If you have a breed of dog that is at higher risk or a mixed breed of dog that has that deep chest appearance, then you should be talking with your veterinarian about a gastropexy as a prevention. So tacking the stomach to the abdominal a wall at the time of spay or neuter is something that we can offer for dogs that have a higher risk than the general population. There are a number of different options for how a prophylactic gastropexy can be done. There was one study that looked at over 700 dogs and 
of those 700 that had received gastropexies, none of them ended up having a GDV. It's possible they could develop a GDV despite having a gastropexy. It's just incredibly rare. The other good thing about these is that the complications and risks are quite low. There is a little bit more anesthesia time, of course. They do need a bit more healing time. Very rarely I'll see a dog that might have some acid reflux after a gastropexy. All this to say, the risks of a prophylactic gastropexy are very low and they dramatically reduce the risk of a GDV to essentially zero. I'm all about prevention here. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me in this video. Have you had a gastropexy done on one of your dogs? How did the recovery go? Please tell me down below. I love to hear from you. If you have a topic you'd like to see me cover in the future, don't hesitate to let me know that as well. This topic had been requested in the past a few times times, so I'm glad I got around to covering it. I also read every single comment you leave for me, and to prove it, I highlight a new one every single week. I put up a new video most Fridays, and I cannot wait to see you in the next one. You take care of yourself. Bye! If we have the option of blood glit... <laughs>